afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming, uh, especially during uh, the height of exams. It's good to see you all. Um, as a way to introduce our speaker um, this evening, Gabby Logan. Um, Gabby Logan is a Welsh television and radio presenter and former rhythmic gymnast who represented Wales and Great Britain. She hosted the final score for BBC Sport from 2009 until 2013, and she has also presented live sports events for the BBC, including the Revive Sports of Superstars in December 2012 and London Marathon since 2015. Um, since 2013, she's co-hosted Sports Personality of the Year for the BBC and, is, and she's presented the second series of The Edge in 2015. She's done loads more and we're going to delve into that today. Thank you for coming. Most importantly, thank you, Gabby, for taking thank time for to meet me. Thank you Thank you. Pleasure to have Hi. you. Um, I'm going to start with a few questions and I'm going to hand over to the audience. Um, my first question, um, I want to go straight into it and go into your background. Um, your father was a professional football, footballer um, and he was, described as a, he was described as a hard man. Um, and he was evidently a, a key figure in your life. Um, could you share, I was wondering if you could share um, specific lessons or any hard knocks that you learned from him um, that have sort of played a significant role in shaping your career. Um, is there anything that can... Yeah, can absolutely. Um, and um, he would have been uh, 16 when he was uh, sent from home uh, in Cardiff. He was born in Cardiff, his family were from all, all from South Wales, and he went to Leeds United to play professional football. Um, and when he used to tell this story when I was a little girl, I used to think, oh, well, that's, you know, that's cool, 16. And then I had a 16-year-old son and thought of sending him kind of to be a professional footballer hundreds of miles away, living with a strange family that he'd never met before and, you know, going into that really tough environment of a, of a top football club where, you know, they, they hold no prisoners and people can be quite cruel if you don't measure up to the, you know, the standards that you should, should live to. Um, yeah, I, I think that is a really tough way to kind of start your professional life. And he was from a very working class family and everybody did blue collar jobs and nobody had been to university, nobody really went to school beyond 16. So his way out of that life was to be a professional sportsman. And so there was great hope on his shoulders that he would achieve something. And I think that builds a certain character. It builds somebody who is very hardworking and determined and, but also, um, he had a little bit of, um, you might, might kind of chip on his shoulder a little bit about kind of life and, you know, he was quite cynical and um, he didn't trust, you know, kind of uh, that people were necessarily going to be telling him things at face value because when you're a professional footballer, you know, you're only as good as your last performance on the pitch. So he created, I guess, an environment when we were growing up that um, he always made us feel that you really had to work hard to get on and achieve in life and you weren't going to be kind of given anything. It was, you know, all going to come from your own industry and, um, and your hard work. So I guess as a child, that was a big lesson from him. And um, luckily I had a mum who was a bit softer <laughs> and she, she was a bit more kind of uh, nurturing in that respect. But seeing his disappointments in sport, seeing his achievements in sport, um, it, it, you might think, well, why did you want to work in sport? And that sounds really cruel and a hard place to be. But I also saw the joy and I saw the, um, the passion that he had for sport. And he gave us a lot of passion for sport. We all, me and my siblings, were all very sporty and, you know, and got a lot out of it. So um, he definitely had a massive influence on, on all of our lives in that respect, in terms of his um, ability to kind of work hard and, and graft and get to where he wanted to be. But also, I think, uh, a reality as well about what can look like a very glamorous life from the outside is, is tough, you know, professional sport and getting to the top in professional sport is really tough. Um, speaking about professional sport, um, we spoke a little bit earlier about this, about um, whether if you'd been a footballer beforehand, uh, if your career would have been very different. And I wanted you to talk a little bit about sort of women's sport, um, how that's changed, how does that actually had an effect on your career as well? Yeah, well, when I was a child, I was born in 1973, and um, women's football had been banned for about 40 years. I think it was just around that time it was allowed to be played again. So the chances of me being a footballer were slim to nothing because there was no football for women in the schools that I went to. And it was when I was in high school, and I was about 15, I had a really amazing PE teacher and she wanted to try and get a five-a-side women's team going, but there was nobody to play against because there were no other women playing in our area. And so I, I couldn't have been a professional footballer because it just wasn't an option at my, you know, at that age. Um, at that time. So I now work with women like Alex Scott or Karen Carney who've been professional footballers and now have careers as broadcasters. And it, it's amazing, you know, to see the kind of transformation in women's sport and to see where those women have come from in the last 15, 20 years to playing, you know, when Alex first started playing for England, 
there would have been a couple of you know people and their dogs watching. And now you go to Wembley and you've got a sold out Wembley Stadium watching the Lionesses. So uh, women's sport has, has come on dramatically in all kinds of areas in terms of the standard, in terms of the amount of people watching it, um, but also the opportunities beyond the sport as well. So um, I'm you know I'm thrilled for those women. I, I do uh, kind of look back and think, oh my, would I have played football? You know, because my dad had a really interesting attitude towards my sport was rhythmic gymnastics and he couldn't understand why I was spending all this time doing a sport that I would never earn a living from because I just loved the sport. Because for him, sport was about sacrifice and hard work and then one day you might earn a living from it. So, because he didn't do an Olympic sport, he did a professional sport. So he was kind of quite bemused by my, you know, uh, passion and the time that I spent playing and training and competing. But I guess if I'd played football like my brothers did, you know, he might have seen it in a different way. And I did have, you know, brothers who played football. And you know, when you see the um, the opportunities and the way, you know, football is, it's you know, it's out there on its own in this country in terms of the the money that's involved in football, the way that kids are scooped up at the age of eight, nine years old, put into academies, you know, and that will start to happen in the women's game as well. You'll get you know, women who are not going to university anymore, they're not going to do sixth form anymore, they're going straight at 16 years old to be professional footballers. So, you know, a lot, a lot is changing in women's sport. Some of it is really good. I hope that some of the values and some of the, um, the, the kind of quirks of the women's game that we really enjoy, the fact they don't run around and, and dive, and, you know, the fact that they, they go and see the fans at the end of every game in the way that the men's teams don't, I hope those things survive and they can retain that really lovely kind of um, family environment that they create at women's games, which is a totally different atmosphere to a men's Premier League game. Talking about the women's game, I think one of the things that has been spoken about um, a lot of media has been sort of the viewership of it and the growing viewership, especially since the Euros, which you broadcasted as well. Um, I was wondering if, the, apart from sort of funding and monetary um, investment that can be put into women's sport, is there anything else in terms of attitudes towards women's sport, especially women's football? That could, that could change or needs to be changed? Well, I think the women's Euros was uh, an incredible success for, for the women's game, for women's sport in terms of viewers, you know, exponentially off the charts, 120% higher viewing for women's sport in 2022 to 2021. So, you know, the metrics were all there. It was amazingly successful. People came to the games. So even games that didn't involve England, those games were sold out. So all those things were huge successes for um, women's game in this country, and indeed UEFA would see it as a massive success. Um, but obviously then you have to have that continued interest in the game. And this season, the WSL has had a rise in attendances as well. So there are a lot more people going to WSL games, a lot more people watching WSL games on the television. So. All those things are really um, positive, and I think what is positive is the demographic as well. It's not just women going to watch women's sport. I think I've always said that you need to have women and men going to enjoy women's football if women's football is going to be successful, um, because it has to attract society, not just you know one one part of society. So um, at the moment, I think the attitude is is um, positive, and there is a lot of uh, goodwill towards the women's game as well. There's a lot of interest from sponsors and from brands to be associated. The, the lead characters, if you like, in the story are all really exciting and interesting young women that people want to hear from. So women's football is certainly going the right way. Women's rugby is also on that kind of upward curve. If you look at the big national team sports, women's cricket as well has been very successful in this country. So I think, I think the attitudes are certainly, you know, so much more positive than they were five, ten years ago even. And, and then the other part of this is that you have to have a product that people want to watch. And that has certainly flourished in the last few years. The games are very exciting. The standard of play is very exciting. The standard of coaching is now so much better as well. So everything is moving in the right direction. It's more professional and there's more opportunities. So the next thing is the grassroots game. You know, you've got to kind of have the talent base coming through. And I know that in football, women's football in this country, there are pockets of the country where there is still very few women's teams. So, you know, you don't want to start having those regional strangleholds, a bit like you do in rugby union, which is so much more dominant in the South. So you want to have that kind of national spread, if you like. Ironically, central London isn't very good for women's football, but the academies are all good. But you know, if you're at school in central London, it's very hard to play women's football. If you're at school in Manchester, there's loads of women's football. You know? So there's lots of different parts of the country which have really strong women's game. And then you know, it's down to grassroots, isn't it? It's volunteers, it's parents getting involved and, and pushing their, you know, their team and their kids forwards. Um, as you were talking, you mentioned um, the contribution um, for, from society 
um, and you've done a lot of charitable work. Um, um, as much as being as excellent as you are as your job, you also managed to find the time to do a lot of philanthropic work. Um, you're the president of the Muscular Dystrophy Society, yes, true, yeah. um, and you're on the patron for like the Princess Trust, Disabilities Trust, Great Ormond Street Hospital. I want to ask, as someone that is so involved in your, so successful in your career, um, and also quite charitable, do you think that to have, to drive so charitable efforts, you need to be successful first before you can have that effect? Or do you think that you need to have like some sort of like traumatic or traumatic experience, personal experience before you can then make those charitable No, I mean, Muscular Dystrophy UK, of which I'm president, and tomorrow night we have our, our annual sports quiz in the long room at Lord's. Um, I'd like to say you're welcome, but I haven't got any more invites, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and that came to me uh, as I had no connection with muscular dystrophy at all, and where they asked me to go for lunch to see whether I'd like to take over from Sue Barker, who was the previous president, and I was all ready to say no, because my kind of charity calendar was full. I just didn't have enough space. And then... I went out with this fantastic doctor who does research into muscular dystrophy and he had me kind of in tears after about 10 minutes telling me about how the disease affects children and how they can start life, you know, running around playing football at seven years old and by the time they're 12 they can be in a wheelchair. And at the time I had a, an eight-year-old boy and, you know, who loves running around and it, it does affect boys more than girls and Duchenne's is particularly a boy's kind of strain of the disease and um, I, he really managed to kind of, you know, touch the right spot and uh, I got involved in what is a, is a great charity. But I do, um, generally I'd previously been involved in charities that I did have some kind of connection with and um, Great Ormond Street is, I, I think any human being would struggle to not, you know, if you're asked to do something by Great Ormond Street, they're such an incredible place. Um, and it's, it's for me, to be able to help and do anything you can for these amazing causes. We're a very charitable country, actually. We've got such an incredible history of different charities that do amazing things that spreads then around the world. You know, what they do at Great Ormond Street and research into, you know, ch childhood diseases is, affects children all over the world. So um, it's a great privilege to, you know, to be asked and to try and help when you can, I think. So, and you get, you know, life's, you know, as you get older, you realise, you know, kind of... Um, life is obviously about more than just what you can achieve in your career and you want to try and help as many people as you can along the way so yeah i try and you know try and do what i can and try and be as useful as i can i'm talking about achievements in career um i recently saw um i think, I think it was twitter but it was like media uproar um, about the national tv awards not nominating any sort of mm. sports broadcasting personnel mm. um and i wanted to know as a sort of sports broadcaster did you do you think that there's sort of underappreciation for... Well, your, I'm bound to say yes, aren't I? Yes, Because of course, obviously... Of uh, so the National Television Awards, um, the presenters are always really great people, you know, like Claudia Winkerman for The Traitors, or um, I don't know who else was nominated in the category. I think she'll win it. I, I couldn't remember who else in the category. But anyway, there were no sports broadcasters, and there never are sports broadcasters, and somebody had pointed this out, because sports broadcasting is a very skilled area of broadcasting because unlike those kinds of like entertainment shows where they kind of know what's going to happen throughout the whole piece, with sport, you start off and you don't know what's happening in the next few hours that you're on telly. So we often don't have autocue. We, you know, we write our scripts that we can say pre-match. We might write some chats out pre-match, but we can't know what's going to happen in the first half. So everything that happens you know, after that is is ad-libbed effectively and is, is done on the hoof, which scares the bejesus out of most other broadcasters, the idea that you go in not knowing what's going to happen. I guess it's what we love, because we love the sport and we get the adrenaline buzz from, from that kind of situation. In fact, I always like to say that I, I much prefer it when something goes a little bit wrong that I can help solve than if it's all perfect, because if it's all perfect, then there's not you don't get that kind of kick, you know, that kind of hit of adrenaline out of it. So when something's going a little bit wrong, that's, that's when I kind of feel like you, we really step up to you know, the plate. And if you've got a pundit who's being a bit tricky or something's going on in the match that you've got to have some technical background knowledge for. So I think you know, it, is a, it is a very skilled area of broadcasting. And a lot of sport broadcasters then go into you know, other areas because live TV is what we do, whereas other areas of TV are a bit scared of live TV because it has all kinds of problems that can come with it. So, um, yeah, I think I think um, I think sports broadcasting is a, a very specialised and you know a very skilled area to work in in TV. But then I would say that, wouldn't I? <laughs> of course. And talking about that, in terms of like access of, of opportunity and getting people involved, do you think that for non so people that haven't played professional sport, do you think that there's an easy way for them to get involved, or do you think there's like such a high barrier? 
No, I think, um, obviously, if you're going to be a pundit, you know, if you're going to sit on the match of the day sofa yeah. and be asked questions, then you've got to have played the sport. Um, I noticed that um, BT Sport a couple of times this season used journalists um, who haven't necessarily played at the highest level, but they're really, really knowledgeable. Um, and then there's a Monday Night Club on Five Live, which um, has Rory um, Smith, who writes for the New York Times. And he's a brilliant contributor, but it isn't an ex-footballer. Um, so I think you can, you know, you can have those specialists come in. And certainly from the job that I do, I don't think you have to have been, you know, at the very, very top of the game. You can be a real passionate sports fan to, to do it. I think it helps to have some understanding of what it's like to be in the heat of a sporting arena, though. You know, you might have only played uni sport, or you might have played, you know, for your county. You don't have to have played in the Premier League. But I think it's a good, um, uh, having a good understanding of what it's like to be in that sport helps, I think, and to have, or a sport, any sport, you know. Yeah, um, I wanted to move on to talk about um, your, your personal sort of love, which is I know Newcastle um, United. I know you're a fan, I know you're on the, on the board as well. Um, I'm not on the board. <laughs> oh, you're <laughs> no, oh, I'm patron oh, of the patron foundation. Of the foundation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm not rich enough to be on the board of Newcastle United. Oh, that, that, that leads, me, leads me perfectly to my question. Um, do you think that the recent Saudi takeover um, sort of questions or puts into question um, the club's identity and sort of values that it has? Um, and do you think that it sort of... How, how does it open up questions about sports washing? Because mm -hmm. um, I think recently... Just throw it all in the mix, James. Throw it yeah, all out there. Because re recently, a lot of footballers um, have... Of course, been going to Saudi. You saw Benzema recently be transferred, yeah. uh, Messi into, into, into Miami, um, and previously Ronaldo being to Saudi as well. Uh, do you think? Do you think that the sports wash, sports, 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 sports washing is happening? Um, and so, sort of what effect does that have on the fans? Okay. Well, I think you know that the horse has bolted, if you like, um, because obviously we've had. Um, Manchester City have had money coming from sovereign wealth funds and you know from Abu Dhabi for a long time. We've had Qatari interest in Paris Saint Germain. Um, we've got obviously Newcastle United with the Saudi Arabian um, sovereign wealth funds. Um, we've had a World Cup in Qatar, obviously. Um, and so this and now what's happening in golf, what's happened in Formula One, what's happened in boxing with Saudi money that's gone into those events as well. It's been going on for a few years now, this, this kind of um, influx of money. Um, I think it's very easy just to kind of like look at sport and say, and, bl and almost blame sport. But when you look at our high streets, you know, the Saudi Arabian government pretty much own Uber, you know, the amount of money that went into that. There's the high street um, supermarkets that are, have got massive amounts of Qatari money in. And, you know, so our whole world has got money coming from these sovereign wealth funds that invest in all kinds of businesses. Sport is very glamorous and sport is very um, uh, interesting, you know. If, you're, if, you have, if I had money to invest, you know, I would, I would want to invest in sport as well if that was one of the things that, um, you know, I could have in my portfolio. Um, obviously, the, the washing aspect of this is to try and, you know, is, there's an argument that are they trying to sanitise what they are as a society or what they're, you know, the values that we perhaps have put upon them that we don't like or things that we don't like about what they do. It's very, very hard, I think, to sit on any kind of moral high ground, though, you know, where would you be, you know, if, if, you, if, if you have to apply that criteria to everything that we have in our, in our lives, it's very, it's very difficult to sit and kind of, I know a lot of people do about Newcastle, they find it distasteful that, that it has Saudi Arabian money involved, and as a fan of the club, I found it difficult, you know, when, they, when I knew that was, he was coming in. The flip side of that is what's happened at the club, and I'm not talking about on the pitch, what they have done in the community, how they have galvanised the women's team. They've been very clever about the people that are on the ground are really into the local club. So when you talk about the, the, you know, the disengagement, if you like, with the local community and the club, they've kind of gone full circle and done it the other way. They have really gone into the grassroots and really looked at... I met um, one of the people who runs the club, Amanda Stavely, because I was a, I'm a patron of the foundation, and I said to her, if you want to get this place, you know, when I first met her, if you want to get this place on side, you've got you've to understand kind of who these fans are, and we were at a foundation dinner, and she could see for herself that the, the way the club works within the community, the educational programs, all those things needed investment, and that's what they've done. You know, they've invested in those things, and they've done things that people in the area really 
you know, it really means a lot to them. We've put up, as Newcastle United fans, with rubbish results for a long time, right? So, actually, when they took the club over, we were second from bottom in the Premier League. Within a year, you know, year and a half, we're in the Champions League, right? So, there is no denying that their investment has helped on the pitch. Absolutely no denying that. An incre a very clever appointment in Eddie Howe that people thought was a stopgap. He turned out to be a really good you know, appointment for the club. And, but he's also done it in a way from the grassroots upwards. When you have a look at you know, the players that you know, he's brought back into the fold, the players that he has acquired as well, he's changed you know, certain players' positions. He's helped kind of players to regain their confidence as well. It's not all been about big marquee signings, even though he has had money to spend. So, I think it's probably been done in a different way to that which people were expecting. I think people were expecting them to go out and buy some really big names, you know. Can we get hold of Neymar? Can we get hold of, you know, is Messi going to come to Newcastle? Of course he's not. Of course Messi's not going to come to Newcastle. And that probably would have been a really bad way of blowing 200 million quid. But we're not, um, as a club, I don't think we're in a, in a position where if they pull everything away right now, they're not going to take the heart of that club away because that club has, you know, has, has kind of found itself again in that respect locally. What's happened, I think, is has been quite amazing actually when you go up there and what the fans feel for, you know, for the ownership is is actually the people that are on the ground there, not necessarily the people that are thousands of miles away. And you know, football fans are fickle as well. You know, they will, <laughs> they will be fine while things are going well on the pitch. Obviously, maybe if things hadn't gone so well, they might not have felt quite such goodwill. But as I say, I think what they've done really cleverly is, what they've been clever about is investing in the stuff that matters to the people who live in Newcastle. I want to touch on the point which uh, you, you actually brought up, which was around um, sort of being on the board. Um, and I wanted to know, do you think there's is there any ways you think football can do better in terms of letting its fans be involved in decisions rather than it being like five, six billionaires um, mm -hmm. who literally control every single decision um, that a football club makes? I think it's really interesting. That's the German model, isn't it? You know, where the fans own the clubs and have a say in, in things and have voting rights at the clubs. And um, we were discussing this the other night at home, actually, kind of at the dinner table, we were talking about which leagues were best in Europe because obviously... Um, two English clubs have won European trophies this season and three Italian clubs have been beaten in finals this season. Um, but obviously, you know, Serie A, La Liga, they're all great leagues. Um, but if you look at, you know, what's happened in German football, the, you know, obviously it's not been as strong. The national team's not been as strong. They haven't had a Champions League winner as well for a while. So, you know, does fan ownership mean that actually it hampers progression on the pitch or, you know, in terms of, the talent that they can attract, you know, they're going to lose Jude Bellingham from that league, you know, so it's, it, can, can they hold on to talent? Probably not, because they haven't got the money that is swishing around in the rest of Europe. So um, fan ownership is, is, I think, is a great way to run a club. It's, ideal, it's idealistic, it has, you know, has a real purity to it. Ultimately, what, what do you want, though? You know, and that's a decision, I guess, that, you know, fans have to make, isn't it? So, um, and that some fans will sacrifice owning their club if they can see their club in the Champions League. Others would rather kind of never get to that holy grail, but still feel that they have a real say in what the club does. And that all kind of came to a head, didn't it, with the European Super League in lockdown when that came and went within four days. And, and there was, there's all this talk of revolutionising the way football's done in this country and having more fan say. And, and some clubs do have much more fan say than others. But this, these are big businesses. You know, so these are huge businesses dealing with hundreds of millions of pounds. And so you wouldn't let just, you know, anybody without any kind of, you know, financial education or, you know, background in, you know, looking at a spreadsheet, make huge decisions about the finances of a business. And football is a business. So I think it's, um, it's an idealistic way of running a football club. I'm not sure it has any kind of... Uh, traction in this country, though, in terms of the big clubs. I don't think it's ever going to come back to that kind of idealism. Thank you for your insight on that. Um, I had one final question. Um, going back to your, your family, um, you mentioned that you're very sort of, protective of your family um, and very protective of, of the sort of things that matter to your family. Um, and I wanted to ask a question around being in the media spotlight from very young, being, like, being part of a football family. Um, do you think sometimes the media can do a bit too much and go inside people's personal lives, which might then have an emotional effect? Um, and if so, th does that mean the media needs to back off or does that mean that it needs to maybe focus on other aspects of people's lives? Because the media is always going to 
want to sort of report on like the famous mm. people and their children and what their siblings are doing, what their uncle is doing. Um, but do you think sometimes that can be quite toxic? Yeah, I mean, it, it can obviously have a massively negative impact on a, on a family. And I think I made a decision quite, well, the husband and I made a decision about our family that I felt with social media, you can kind of control a little bit more than you used to. So when, when we were first, Kenny and I and my husband was a rugby player, we were first together, we would find ourselves being papped, you know, quite a lot. We'd go out and there'd be paparazzi somewhere. And when I was pregnant, I was papped all the time. This is pre-social media. So once social media came, you can decide what you want to share. And then I think the paparazzi industry as a whole probably kind of was, was decimated by social media because people started to decide what they wanted to give. And we kind of made a decision that if we gave a little bit, then hopefully that would sate people's desire to know more about your family rather than keeping everything kind of really, really secret and then they want to find out more, you know? So, um, so I think we kind of managed to get the balance probably right on that and then included our kids in those kinds of decisions about things, you know, do you want to talk about this or do you want to be seen here and, you know, and everybody's different, but we wanted to give them a balanced approach to the life that when people come up and talk to us in the street that we don't know, you know, our kids are going to, you know, kind of work out that something's, you know, who, well, what do you do? Why are those people interested? I always remember being in a, a sports shop on my kids, um, must have been their ninth birthday. We were in Glasgow for the Commonwealth Games. I was working and it was their birthday. And we went into a sports shop to buy them tennis rackets for their birthday. And this guy followed me into the shop and he said he wanted a picture. And I said, oh, it's my kid's birthday. I'd really like to just have this moment with them while I'm just choosing their present with them. And he got really cross and angry with me and then kind of like stormed out the shop. And then when we came out the shop, he was waiting for me outside the shop. So um, some people kind of, they see you on TV and they, they want, they think you're, you know, their mate because they've seen you on TV. So they're allowed to just go shopping with you or they're allowed to follow you around, you know. But most people are generally very um, lovely. And I think if you're, you know, you're going in their living rooms a lot, you know, they turn the TV and they see you. So of course there's a, an affinity. And actually when I see someone in the street and they want to talk, that's lovely because without them I wouldn't have a job because they wouldn't be a viewer, you know. So, um, so I think there's a balance to be had, isn't there? And trying to be, you know, kind of polite and let somebody come in a little bit. But at the same time, you have to keep, I think, a protective arm around, you know, your family. And at the time, that was obviously with my kids. I didn't want their moment to be, you know, kind of intruded upon by somebody. Perfect. Um, does anyone have any questions? They're over here. Yeah. Um, who's the funniest football um, if I, um, if I if I said a top three, um, are you probably you probably have them in your head already. Probably uh, Micah, Michael Richards, um, Ian Wright, and um, who are of the women? Who are the women? Jill Scott's very funny. Jill Scott, yeah. So would you say Micah would be the your yeah yeah Micah is yeah Micah's pretty much like that all the time. So even when he's off air, he's like that. So yeah, you've got to have a lot of energy. And Ali McCoist as well, obviously he's, he's numero uno. He's, the, he's like the godfather, he's the oldest, so he's like in the original, you know. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, just here. Um, yeah, at the beginning, it was quite a, a lonely space. Um, there weren't many women who worked in front nor behind the camera. So when I first got to Sky, there was one female director and uh, there were no female producers on the show that I was working on. And there was one woman who booked camera crews. You tended to find when I first arrived at Sky that the women did the admin jobs. And um, a, a great girl who worked on the show, who was a real kind of ally, she did all the cameras, booked all the camera crews. But then everybody else was pretty much male in that office. Um, and then gradually over time, obviously, you know, more women came in behind the camera as well as in front of the camera. But in that, in those early days, it did, it did feel quite male. And especially, I noticed it more when I go away on big trips like World Cups and all the, the written press. When I, the first trips I went on, when I went to the South Africa World Cup in 2010, doing the England role, all the written press were male. So we'd go on these big, you know, coaches to the training grounds to watch training of England and that everybody on the coach would be male. And um, and I'm not a kind of girly girl, but I would find myself going back to my room in the hotel and I'd, I'd really want to kind of read a magazine or something or do something, because I just was missing, you know, a bit of, um, a bit of female the company. Sport, they're, they're a bit novel. They've arrived with combat sports and arrived with cyber sports. Um, bit, bit different to sort of traditional rugby. Um, 
Do you mean like esports? Yeah. 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 Like, um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on, on these sorts of trends. Um, in particular, you know, obviously with combat sports, you don't have injury to threat notification. Mm. Um, mm. um, they both feel like they're motivated financially. Right. So, like the. Um, the kind of combat sports, the massive, you know, when you say combat sports, we've had boxing, obviously, for, you know, yeah. from time immemorial. But yeah, those are kind of mixed martial arts type events seem like they're generated by promoters, you know, it feels like um, something that's almost made for the viewer. It's a sport that's made for the event, it's made for the, for the, for the TV, and, um, and you've got to get behind an individual, I guess, to feel invested, or you've got to feel that you're really into the sport in some way, and most people, are not going to have the kind of nuances of the sport necessarily up their sleeve, but they want they want to champion a certain fighter. You know, um, I, I don't watch loads of MMA, so I can't talk about the sport per se. But it does feel like it's very promoter heavy, you know, and and it's made for for TV in the in the states. When you look back at kind of like the way wrestling was so huge, kind of thirty years ago, it feels like it's filling that space, but in a slightly more aggressive way. And then with esports, it's a similar thing, I guess. You know, it's financially very. Um, there's a big motivation, isn't there, to, to fill these huge arenas and create these. They're usually very young, from what I understand, the people who do well, because you know you can't concentrate that much when you kind of get into your people are sitting there kind of practicing for 10 hours a day on their computers and stuff and longer. Um, we were talking about the other day, um, I was with a group of like ex-sports people, and they were just disgusted <laughs> that it even had any traction because it's you know, they were like, it's not real sport, it's not real sport. And in a way, it's not real sport. You know, it's it's kind of um, it's like a almost a um, an augmented reality, isn't it? Um, because I guess if you haven't got to what's the what's the thing that people say if you if you don't change your shoes, it's not a sport. Um, how, that's how some people decide that darts isn't a sport because if you don't change your shoes, I don't agree with that. But I guess um, with the esports, you know, you don't even really need to change your clothes, do you? Um, so I guess. I guess it's, a, um, it's not for the purist, let's say. Um, I think it's, it's a thing and it's, it's competitive and, you know, and it's, it's a pastime, but is it an actual sport? I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not fully wedded to the idea that it is. Uh, does, it, you know, does it take your heart rate up? Does it make you fitter? Do you feel stronger because of it? Do you, you, know, do you have um, all the attributes that come through being athletic? You no, know, you don't need any of those, do you, for esports? So, it doesn't feel to me um, it fits somewhere else, but not necessarily in the Olympics. Uh, just cue, cue the Olympics in LA in four years' time, four and a half years' time, and there'll be an esports <laughs> gold medal. I'll be going, this is amazing. <laughs> this is fantastic. As I've always said, love it. Yes. Um, I just want to ask a question um, regarding the idea of money coming into the game. I know we spoke about it earlier. Um, do you think it's sad sometimes that achievements that have been made by the big sort of oil tycoon style clubs have almost got an asterisk attached to it? We look at Manchester City recently winning the treble, and a lot of people almost compare that to Manchester United winning the treble. And when we talk about Manchester City, from what I've heard, it's almost like, okay, they've won the treble. Are you a City fan? I'm a United fan. Right, okay. But a lot of people from an objective stance mm. almost look at Manchester City winning the treble and say, they won the treble, but mm. what do you think that means for future achievements of clubs that don't necessarily go down that route of money being plugged in, especially of a similar size? Um, I guess the fans and the fans that turned out, was it last night? It was last night, wasn't it, their, their victory parade? The fans who followed them, and they'll say through, you know, thick and thin, those that were there when they were languishing down the leagues, and, you know, it wasn't that long ago, obviously, when that war was happening to them, um, they'll, they'll be thrilled they won't care that they've got 115 charges against them that are pending you know and that they, they're going to have to answer to you know those assertions at some point who knows how long that'll take to come to fruition and will they you look at rugby what's happened with Saracens you know and they were obviously demoted because of financial irregularity and um, unfair play basically um, do people then, you know, kind of have an asterisk a bit about Saracen's achievements in the past? You know, because I, you know, talk to a lot of kind of rugby fans who feel quite bitter about that, about the leagues that they won, you know, in that time that they were breaking the rules. And so other fans will probably have more of a, you know, if it's their team that Manchester City have beaten to a title, they might then decide that, you know, that it's not fair that their team was that season should have won. Like if. 
if Manchester City end up, you know, being found guilty of, of these charges, they're not going to take away, are they going to go back and take away titles from them? I, I doubt it very much. It would probably end up being fines that they're subjected to. Are they going to go back and give Arsenal the title this season? You know, I doubt it very much. So, you know, in the future, who knows if in a few years' time they, they, it comes out that, you know, they did transgress some serious breaches and some serious rules were broken. Arsenal fans would probably feel quite aggrieved, wouldn't they, that they, you know, came close to winning a title. So I think, you know, if you're the, the club that's been, you feel wronged by it, you probably have stronger feelings than if you're not kind of in that mix, you know, if you're not in that heady mix. Because it does feel, if you're a, a fan of a club that is never going to win the league, what goes on at the top of the league sometimes feels like another world, doesn't it? You know, and I, I say that as a Newcastle fan until this season, I just would be like, oh, that's good. I like watching them play. I'm not saying Man City, but whoever, they're interesting. They've got good players. But it would seem like another another land that they were existing in, the amount of money they're spending, the amount of players that seem to, you know, look at Chelsea, the amount of players that they've got at that club just feels ridiculous compared to if you're a club that's lower down the league. So it does it does feel like a fantasy land when you look at these clubs that have got the, you know, the money from the oil-rich states. It doesn't feel... Um, like the same game in many ways. Imagine what Manchester City are doing. It doesn't feel like the same game because they've got such incredible talent, haven't they? And they're playing... I mean, they didn't play Champions League, um, the best football they played in the Champions League final, but they managed to get over the line. But they've played some amazing football this season. And I think most clubs just feel kind of like, well, we can never, you know, we're never going to beat, beat them at the moment the way they are. So I think if you're feeling aggrieved, you'll probably you'll probably decide that that's the reason why. But um, we just got to admire the football. I think the footballers that go on the pitch are sportsmen who, and women, but and, you know, you're talking about the Premier League, but they're sportsmen who were little boys who wanted to play football and they're now achieving amazing things. And you look at Jack Grealish, you know, at the weekend and what that meant to him, what's meant to him this, you know, what's meant to him to drink all the beer in Manchester over the last two days. Um, he, I think, is that kind of heartbeat and that, you know, that passion that people recognise as somebody who just loves the game and loves to play. And I think when you see the personalities, you can slightly distance yourself from the stuff that goes on, you know, behind uh, the boardroom doors and try and enjoy the football, I guess. As a Man United fan, if you can. <laughs> okay, just here. Yeah, yeah uh, thank you for coming here, Gary. Uh, so, two questions, short questions. The comment on esports, I do agree. But when Snoop was on, I got really into it. Is Snoop a classic sport? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, darts? Well, yeah, that's what I was saying. It was darts that people used to have this thing with. Is darts a sport because you, can, you don't change your shoes? But, um, yes, because um, have, you, have you... Do you play darts? I can't play any darts, but I love all sports. Yeah. And, um, no, I think darts is a sport, yeah. Crashing decades ago, chess was really big. But anyway, my major question was... <laughs> Um, which rugby team would you follow, given the fact that you were born in England, you represented Wales, and you married to a Scottish rugby player? So I always um, uh, kind of sit on the fence slightly on this one, in that I, I, <laughs> I always support Wales um, in rugby. Um, well, actually, I always support Wales in football. I always, until we get, you know, to previously, until I've gone to World Cups and I've been with the England team and things like that, and Wales haven't been there, but Wales were there in Qatar. Well, kind of there, not at the best. But the rugby situation has got a bit more complicated in our house because uh, my son signed for Northampton and he played under 18s for England just recently, and that was really hard for his dad um, watching that um, because obviously, in the pathway, he, you know, he, he doesn't have to make a choice till he's 20. But then I, I said to Kenny, what if he does go that route? How does that work then for any of us in the family? Because you kind of got to support your own son, right? So, um, yeah, I think um, that will be a big test. But, uh, yeah, Wales, Wales all the way um, until it's not Wales. And then, I'll, and then I'll jump on somebody else. And um, When Wales had an amazing Euros um, in 2016, um, I, was, um, I was working out there... Uh, with England and came home earlier than Wales obviously because Wales were brilliant and um, previously my kids had always said they were Scottish and then the night that Wales played Belgium suddenly they were all Welsh this is the beauty of having a mixed kind of you know household of different Celtic nations so yeah it has its advantages um yeah just Gary Lineker debacle and what 
your opinions are on that and kind of being what you can say politically and what you have to keep to yourself. So that was an extraordinary few days, obviously, you know, to see that kind of, I'd been messaging Gary early in the week just saying, hope everything's okay, you know, and he was fine. And then suddenly it seemed to escalate into this, we thought it was all sorted and then it became Gary not doing match of the day and you know the rest is history, what happened that weekend. Um, I mean, I was getting calls from people, I was doing the Six Nations, Scotland, the Ireland match on the Sunday, people asking me if I was gonna go ahead, you know, and I said, if we don't do the rugby, we may as well come off every live broadcast this weekend. There'll be no Radio 2, no Radio 5, no Radio 1, because where does the line get drawn in the end to show solidarity? And I don't think Gary ever expected anybody in rugby not to go and do the Six Nations, you know, so it became this ridiculous thing that was snowballing. But going back to your original point, I mean, it was, it was a bizarre thing to kind of be in the kind of mix of the, what Gary had always maintained was that he wanted to still be able to talk about anything to do with asylum seekers and refugees and his passion for, you know, being a, um, a supporter of people who he felt were not being treated fairly. And he also wanted to be able to talk about climate change. And, um, and that was obviously, it was a comment to do with the Rwandan refugees, which eventually got him into that situation. So he maintained that he was talking about things that he'd already said that he was gonna carry on talking about. And, and obviously there was a difference of agreement with the director general of the BBC and how that, was, how that played out was Gary coming off match of the day. But then what they said obviously was that they're gonna have a, a, a review into this and the inquiry's ongoing. And in terms of what I feel I can talk about and say is definitely, there is a certain element of curtailing yourself in public because of being um, a broadcaster who does quite a bit of work for the BBC. I don't feel um, as hamstrung as maybe Gary because I think his millions of followers means there's a lot, lot more attention on what he says. But equally, I don't feel like Gary or anybody in BBC Sport has the same responsibility as, say, Hugh Edwards, who's presenting the 10 o'clock news. Hugh Edwards talking, you know, kind of on his social media about... Rwandan refugees would, would be a conflict of interest because then he would go on, he would deliver the story um, in a way that the BBC try and maintain obviously neutrality in the way they deliver those stories. So that would be a conflict of that. Whereas Gary is talking about whether or not Brentford have set up correctly to beat Manchester City, which they did um, this season. So, you know, Gary's, Gary's kind of public persona, if you like, is obviously on the BBC, is all about sport. So I think that's where... I would say there was probably a split in the, down the middle in terms of people, you know, in our department, kind of not sure, you know, how this would play out and how what what we should what rules we should be subjected to, but um, but no, it certainly there is um, a natural kind of filter that you develop that you don't say always the things that you necessarily totally believe or want to say. It's not that you're saying something you don't believe in, but perhaps you're holding things back because of that um, public service broadcasting, which obviously doesn't apply to people who work on ITV and Channel 4 and um, other areas of the media. So um, it was interesting what the, what the inquiry will come out with and maybe we'll get some actual rules because we don't actually know what we're allowed to actually say. So maybe tonight I've said something that, you know, what's Jimmy Carr saying? He's already said the thing that's going to get him cancelled. <laughs> so <laughs> you can dig back and find anything, can't you, that um, perhaps, you know, might be transgressing what I'm supposed to say. So Yeah. Sport is mired in politics. I mean, look, we've talked about sovereign wealth funds and, you know, it's, sport is politics and, and sport has forever been that way. And you look back at the boycotts of Olympic Games in the 1980s, that was all politics at play there, you know, and the way that p political systems have put money into sport to look powerful on a global stage, you know, the way there was state-sponsored um, uh, doping in the, in the Eastern European countries. That was all about a power play, you know, and so you can't, you know, we can never say sport and politics are separate because they're just not, you know, and, um, and, they, and there's a lot more that's actually positive about politics being involved in sport in terms of actually political, um, 
if, if, I was, if I was in party politics, I would want to be with a, in a party that was really pushing sport to the top of you know, school's agendas because it's so good for kids' mental health, it's so good for you know, the nation's health. You know? So in terms, that's political, isn't it? You know, right? So if I, if I, if I tweeted, um, I'll vote for a party that tells me they're going to make it compulsory for sport to 18, is that being political? Should I not say that? You know, I'm putting my my politics out on the you know out front and centre. So, you know, it, it is such a kind of a grey area for a lot of people. Um, but I think when you the the point that you know that, that obviously the BBC were trying to to make was this you know kind of blurring of the lines of what your influence is and how you you know um, you can if you've got millions of followers obviously influence a lot of people. So. As I say, the, the inquiry will tell us, you know, kind of where we should sit on that. But I do think that the idea that politics and sport are separate is is kind of you know another horse that's bolted, really. Yeah. Ben, what version of that I want to ask you? Um, kind of is an institution like the Olympic Games like risking becoming not like redundant, but is it risking kind of giving itself a bad name and damaging its own reputation for its unwillingness to engage with larger political questions. So the whole you know, question of, because we're at a very interesting point, especially with Russia, for example, where mm -hmm. you go from exclusion based on state responsibility to now geopolitical mm -hmm. um, events, right? So is the Olympic Games kind of risking making itself a brand? Where the Premier, for example, does take a um, stand on racism, a stand on homophobia, mm -hmm. the Olympic Games is then unwilling to, not, not you know, it's fine, would take a stand against those and do principle non discrimination, but doesn't really engage with like the larger political questions that represent its own political institutions. Yeah, I mean, it's not really how long have we got? This you know, that's it's huge. That's a thesis, isn't it? You know, and it we'd like to think that the Olympics has got this kind of purity to it, that you know, it's got the whole world is involved, you've got over two hundred nations compete there. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a massive Olympics fan, you know, right from the very beginning of the opening ceremony when the teams walk out and, you know, you go, oh my gosh, is that a country, you know? And so, is that still a country? And, and you've got like these tiny little teams and then you've got these giant, you know, still got these ginormous teams that come from the big old kind of, you know, China and USA and um, previously Russia, you know, all that, all that kind of global, um, you know, that. The, the world is, you know, this tiny place now. We can do anything we like really quickly. We can communicate with people across the other side of the world. We can, you know, nothing is too far. We're, we're able to sit in our rooms and have meetings with people 10,000 miles away. But the Olympics kind of highlights just actually how different we all are. And, you know, that, that is, I think, beautiful about it. You know, and also the Olympics is for everybody in the sense that every sport, you know, you look at the kind of the height, you know, the Olympians are massive, tiny, you know, wide, slim, you know, there's, there's a sport for everybody out there. It's not just this kind of homogenous athlete that's out there. And that part of the Olympics that we all love, that purity, learning about new sports, um, I think the IOC obviously want us to enjoy that part of sport and they don't want to be, you know, dragged into geopolitical questions. They don't want to be dragged into, you know, uh, they don't want to, they want to skirt ethics. They want to skirt, you know, anything that really is not pure to the uh, Olympic Games and its ethos. And obviously, as you say, you know, sport and politics are mixed. And when you have countries that boycott Olympic Games, uh, making political stance, that, that's up to them to do that, obviously. Um, but it's not um, where the IOC want to go with this. And obviously the IOC want to include more sports. They want to kind of feel more inclusive to the whole world so that it's not just, you know, sports that the West enjoys. And wherever you go and host Olympic Games is also a consideration. I think this is another political thing because I was in the Olympics, I went to work at the Olympics in Rio and it was not a successful games in terms of what it's done to the, the country, what it's left behind, you know, and you've got to really be careful about where you're putting these games as well. And that going forward, sustainability, all those things are big questions that the IOC is gonna to have to answer. So um, as an Olympics nut, I hope that the Olympics can still be relevant and still be um, of interest to younger generations. But it has got a lot of issues to, I don't think I've answered your question at all there, but it'd be interesting to chat to you about it. <laughs> um, before we finish, I had a final question. Um, what's been your favorite sporting event that you've covered? The Olympics, no, I'm joking. Um, it would, I have to say, 2012 Olympics in London was probably one of the greatest things that I've ever, to, to go into that village, well, the Olympic 
park every day and call that work and go into the office and watch 12 hours of sport and then present the highlight show every night was just an absolute dream. And the, the country just seemed to be really confident and happy with itself and seemed to have this belief in itself. And it was like, okay, we're a bit different. We're all a bit quirky. We're, you know, we're not quite like the rest, but hey, come and enjoy us. And the world did. And, you know, and the, the Paralympics the same. We were selling out you know, stadiums at the Paralympics where other countries you know, just cannot attract those kinds of crowds. And we're really good at big events. And I think we were kind of, we're also very self-deprecating as a nation, but actually we kind of went, oh, we're actually really good at this. This, this has worked. And it felt like the end of that summer felt like a real high point, I think, in our self-esteem as a nation. I don't know where it's gone, <laughs> but it feels a long way away, that confidence that we had. And that event itself was just, you know, Super Saturday, all of that was, amazing and um, I think it also was the start for me of a massive change in the appreciation for women's sport because we had more female gold medalists in the Great Britain team than men and a lot of those women became household names and that seemed to kind of push women's sport further into the nation's consciousness, the coverage was up so yeah I think that was a golden, a golden summer. I couldn't agree more. Well thank you so much Gabby, it's been a pleasure um, to interview you. Please all join me in a round of applause. Thank you very much everybody. thank you.